And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our first Star Talk of the year. We have Dr. Gilman with us to talk, to talk on how to reveal the nature of dark matter with strong gravitational lensing. Dr. Gilman is a postdoctoral researcher at University of Toronto in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Dr. Gilman's research is focused on investigating the nature of dark matter through strong gravitational lensing by galaxies and galactic dynamics in the Milky Way. So without any further ado, um, Dr. Gilman. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, first of all, can you guys hear me? Can people hear me okay? All right, good. Um, <clears throat> great, well, uh, to get started, I mean, as you can probably tell by the title, uh, I'm gonna be talking about dark matter and gravitational lensing. But in my mind, you know, what this is really about is the dark matter. And so I want this talk to be about dark matter, and then I'll bring lensing in as it's required. Uh, you know, it is the tool that we use to learn about dark matter. But what, we're, what we really care about is the dark matter. And <clears throat> to get started, uh, I like to start with this image. Uh, this is the Hubble Deep Field. It was taken in 1995, and uh, over the course of 10 days, Hubble just pointed itself at the same patch of sky, and it returned to it every day and took an exposure. And then after 10 days, they compiled all the exposures and, and they produced this image. And this entire field of view is 1 25th of a degree across on the sky. So it's a very tiny, you know, to our eyes, dark patch of sky. But when you look at it really deeply, right, you see that it's full of galaxies. And this was kind of a humbling image. You know, it puts into perspective, you know, our place in the universe, I think. Uh, and, you know, it's even more humbling when you realize that that's just 5% of what actually exists in the universe, right? So most of the energy budget of the universe is dark energy. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about dark energy. And just to clear up a, a potential source of confusion, dark energy is not dark matter. So dark energy makes space expands. It's fundamentally mysterious, but it's not stuff. So dark matter in atoms is actual stuff. It has mass, it has gravity, but it may not play by the same laws of physics. And of all the stuff in the universe, uh, just you know, the, the stuff that we're familiar with, you know, us and our everything that we have ever known is only about twenty percent of all of this, all of the matter, all of this stuff. And throughout this talk, uh, I might interchangeably refer to regular matter as baryonic matter or normal matter. And then, you know, what we want to learn about is the rest, which is dark matter. So to get started, I want to just try to convince everyone that dark matter actually exists. And I think a good place to start, especially because we want to talk about lensing is with something called the bullet cluster. So the bullet cluster is two clusters of galaxies that are colliding head on. And they're in this picture, this is just a regular uh, exposure of the bullet cluster. And to guide the eye, I, okay, I'm circling the two clusters, right? There's a small one on the right and a, you know, a larger one on the left. And the one on the right has just plowed through the one on the left. So the one on the right is moving to the right very fast. And the reason that we know that uh, the one on the right is moving to the right very fast is if you look at this image in x-rays, so in, in the red, I superimposed on top of this image a map of x-rays. So x-rays are, are regular light in a particular wavelength range. And <clears throat> since x-rays are emitted by hot gas and dust, you can kind of think of the x-rays as a map of the normal matter. So the, these two clusters came in, they collided, and all of the regular gas and dust and stuff like that interacted with itself. And you can see that it's kind of stuck in the middle while the, the clusters of galaxies themselves have, have kind of flown past each other. The galaxies just fly by, fly by each other as if, you know, like marbles rolling on a table or something. The gas sticks together and it actually forms this shock wave. It's called a bow shock. And it's the same thing that happens when you fire a bullet uh, and it moves supersonically through some medium. So we see this bow shock, we know that there's hot gas and dust, it's emitting in x-rays and it's uh, the relative velocities of these clusters is supersonic and so you see this shock wave. 
Now, what gets interesting is if you make a map of where the mass is, so not of where necessarily the gas and the dust is, but what if you just look for where the majority of the matter is in the cluster? And if you do that uh, and you color, you know, the missing mass blue, you get this picture. So again, the x-rays are in red, you see the bow shock there, and then you see that there are these blobs of blue that are leading the x-rays. And <clears throat> this is like additional matter. We know that it's there, right? But it has no luminous counterpart, right? It happens to align with the galaxies, but we know that there's way more mass there than we can account for with just the galaxies. So there seems to be some missing material there. And the reason that we know it's there is because of gravitational lensing. Uh, and in this case, it's something called weak lensing. Uh, so really quickly before I talk about weak lensing in particular, gravitational lensing itself is just the deflection of light by a gravitational field. And the effect that that has is to displace images of things in the universe with respect to where they actually are. So in this picture that you see, you have some true source, the light leaves, it goes in a straight line. And then there's some big massive thing. In this case, it's a cluster of galaxies and that deflects the light so that when you look, you see its position displaced from where it actually is. So, so that's lensing. And weak lensing is actually going to produce some distortions in, in the way that the whole image looks. So I made a, a short kind of cartoon that, that demonstrates this. So in the center of mass, here's a, you can imagine that that's a galaxy cluster, something very heavy. And then around it, those are pictures of just three galaxies that I, I pull off of the internet, okay? Now, if you turn on weak lensing, you'll see that you can stretch and uh, slightly magnify these images relative to no lensing, right? If I flip back and forth, this, this distortion is fairly evident. And I've exaggerated this by a lot, just so that you can see it by eye. But this is the effect that you can observe around the bullet cluster, right? So we see, if, if we look at the, the galaxies that are behind the cluster, we see that their shapes are slightly distorted and that they're uh, stretched and squeezed in a characteristic pattern that allows us to map where the, where the matter is. <clears throat> and so if we return back to the picture of the bullet cluster, right, we know that this additional matter is there because of its weak lensing effect on galaxies behind it. And you know, I'll, I'll just point out again that the, you know, the, these clusters have flown through each other. The galaxies are like marbles or billiard balls rolling on a table. They don't care. They just fly past each other. The, the gas, which inter interacts through electromagnetism, it sticks together. It gets really hot, right, and shines in x-rays. And then whatever this missing matter is, it also just flies through uh, the regular gas, the regular gas, uh, the rather regular dust, and it also flies through itself. Right? It doesn't interact with itself either, right? There's no dark bow shock like you see in the x-rays. And so this, this kind of lets you define what you mean by dark matter. When people say, you know, dark matter in cosmology, what they're saying is stuff that doesn't interact with light, so it doesn't have a luminous counterpart. It doesn't interact with normal matter, right? So it, it doesn't get heated up like the, the gas and dust gets heated up when it interacts with itself. And it doesn't interact with itself either. It's, it's like the most boring, inert substance that you can imagine, right? The, the only way that it makes contact with anything that we can observe is through gravity. And this is why people have not detected dark matter in a lab, right? You know, no one has, has detected dark matter in the lab. The only positive evidence for dark matter's existence comes from cosmology and astronomy because gravity is what's, you know, the, the most important thing that's at play there. So really quickly, I'll also just point out another important thing for the evidence for dark matter that I think is going to be uh, relevant for what we talk about later, and that's uh, galaxy formation. So if we look at the Hubble Deep Field, uh, this first image that I showed, if we could somehow see the dark matter, we would see something like this. Okay, so all the galaxies are gold in this rendering, and the dark matter looks like this kind of black fuzzy stuff. And 
it connects all the galaxies in this cosmic web. And also, if you look closely, you'll notice that the galaxies live inside of halos of dark matter. And this sort of picture is required to explain why the universe looks the way it does on large scales. It's actually pretty much impossible to form galaxies to the extent that the universe has without some kind of dark matter uh, holding everything together. And uh, uh, I kind of like this movie. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show it really quickly just because I think it, it, it's cool and it maybe helps the intuition here. So if you read, I'm going to drink some water. If you guys want to read the prompt while I drink the water. <clears throat> so basically, this movie is, is just going to turn on gravity and allow dark matter to collapse onto itself and then allow regular matter to collapse onto the dark matter. And as the movie plays, you'll see that you start forming more and more structure over time and that you get galaxies merging into larger galaxies and you know, it all kind of seems to fall onto itself. And this gives us the large scale structure of the universe and we need dark matter to explain the way that looks. <clears throat> so just to, to recap, right, we, we need dark matter to explain the way the universe looks on dark, large scales. And we can even start making statements about what dark matter can be, right? Like whatever it is, it must allow you to have galaxies because if there were no galaxies, we wouldn't be here, right? And you can also say some things about what it can't be. So for example, if dark matter were neutrinos, which are part of the standard model of particle physics, but have really, really weak interactions, there wouldn't be no galaxies. And so we know that uh, dark matter can't be neutrinos, right? <clears throat> And then you also need it to explain other particular observations like the bullet cluster, right? Two colliding clusters and who's, who's, where the, the mass alignment you can't explain with just normal matter. But, right, so this isn't enough, okay? I mean, we know that dark matter exists and we can say some general things about it, but we wanna know more, like what actually is dark matter? And if we want to learn more, we need to go to smaller scales. So everything I've shown you is like clusters of galaxies and the large scale structure of the universe. And if we want to learn more, we have to start zooming in to individual galaxies. So this is uh, another simulation. It's just the, the dark matter cosmic web uh, that I mentioned earlier. And <clears throat> I, I like this particular simulation because you can see the dark matter structure a little bit more clearly than in the other one. And like I said, we want to go to small scales. So I'm going to zoom in to one of these kind of high density regions. And you'll notice that there are these blobs that appear. And the technical term for blobs of dark matter is halo. So dark matter, when it collapses through gravity onto itself, it forms halos. And in the you know, standard picture of galaxy formation, galaxies live inside of halos. So Every galaxy, including our own, lives inside of one of these giant blobs of dark matter. And if you were to zoom into the dark matter halo, what you would see are more halos, right? So they're halos within halos, and we call them subhalos. And inside of those subhalos live smaller galaxies. So our galaxy lives in a very big halo. Our galaxy is surrounded by dwarf galaxies, which we think inhabit smaller halos. <clears throat> However, I mean, as you can see in this uh, schematic, right, most of these halos don't have a galaxy in them, right? They're completely dark, and that's just because they're too small to hold on to stars and gas, and they don't, they, they're not capable of forming a galaxy. So for this reason, that this kind of invisible population of halos is, is referred to as dark substructure in, in the lensing community, at least. <clears throat> and we care about dark substructure because it turns out that the, the number of halos depends directly on what dark matter is uh, on a particle level. And so on the left, I'm showing a picture of a cold dark matter halo or a halo formed with so-called cold dark matter. <clears throat> and on the right is how that same halo might look in warm dark matter. And what makes these two classes of theories different is that cold dark matter forms structure on basically all scales. So you could keep zooming into the subhalos and you would find that they have subhalos and then their subhalos have subhalos and you could go all the way down, right? And warm dark matter, that picture breaks, right? You, you can zoom in and keep finding more subhalos, but eventually you zoom in far enough and you stop seeing structure, right? So this is warm dark matter and cold dark matter. It's two classes of theories, but 
Uh, and both of these, you know, they were up to like five years ago, equally viable explanations for what dark matter could be. We didn't know. <clears throat> and <clears throat> before I go further, I think it's useful to get some intuition for why these two populations of halos look different, right? So why does cold dark matter have lots of structure and why does warm dark matter not have lots of structure? You know, why does, why do we care about the structure? Like what's, what's that actually telling us? And uh, I made another cartoon to explain this. So here is a, you know, a highly simplified version of the universe where on the x-axis is space and the y-axis is the density of the universe. Right, and you can see that if I say that the mean density is, you know, whatever one, some parts are over dense and some parts are under dense, and you have these kind of large fluctuations in the density and small ones on top of it. And in the standard picture of uh, galaxy formation, right, you say that everything that crosses a certain density threshold is going to collapse and form a halo, and it turns out that this density threshold is about seventy percent. Uh, higher than the, the mean background density. So you say, okay, every time that one of these peaks crosses that density threshold, I get a halo, right? So this big peak, that's gonna collapse into a very big halo, right? There's lots of stuff there that's gonna collapse onto itself. And if you zoom into the big peak, right, you see lots of these small peaks. And every single one of these small peaks that crosses the density threshold is also gonna form a halo, right? And because you have lots of structure, right? You have lots of small peaks that will happen to cross the threshold. And so you'll have lots of substructure. And it turns out that in cold dark matter, this, this pattern of fluctuations is scale free. And so you know, the number of halos that are, you know, or the number of regions of the universe that are dense enough to form a halo is invariant as you keep zooming in, right? You keep seeing more structure. <clears throat> So that explains why cold dark matter has lots of subhalos. Now, warm dark matter, the one on the right, the one that has no substructure, it looks the way it does because of early, early time physics in the dark matter. So basically, in warm dark matter, particles move really fast. And when they move fast, they wipe out these small scale wiggles in the density fluctuations. And so this same picture looks much smoother than it does in cold dark matter. And you can play the same game where you say, okay, every time that the line crosses the 1.686 threshold, I'm gonna get a halo. And so you would find the same big halo, right? But if you zoomed in on that big halo, you would all of a sudden see that there are no small peaks that cross the density threshold. And so you have no small halos. So what this does is basically wipes out the subhalo populations of galaxies, but it leaves the large scale structure of the universe unchanged. And so you can still have galaxies. And this was viable because we weren't able to tell the difference between warm dark matter models and cold dark matter models because the effect happens on such small scales. <laughs> so going back to this picture, you know, you, you can kind of amend the statement, which before said that the number of halos encodes the nature of dark matter, right? We, we can make it a little more precise, right? And say that the number of subhalos, it encodes properties of the dark matter particles velocity distribution in the early universe, because this is what's causing the diffusion out of small density peaks that wipes out the small scale structure. Right? And the, the velocity distribution of the particles that's responsible for the smoothing itself depends on the particle mass and the particle formation mechanism. So we can make connections to what dark matter is just by counting halos. Um, I might I might not spend too much time on this, but th this is just a, a different way of thinking about it. So in cold dark matter, the only relevant physics is gravity, which has no scale, right? It's mass over distance squared that determines the force, but it doesn't matter what mass or what distance. So in that sense, it's scale free. And so the structures that you get out of it look like fractals or they have fractal properties where you can zoom in and zoom in and keep seeing the same self-similar structure. And like I mentioned before, in warm dark matter, you have diffusion with, that has a characteristic length scale, which here is called lambda, or the free streaming length is the technical term for this. And it turns out that the free streaming length is uh, inversely proportional to the mass of a warm dark matter particle in certain, in certain models. So again, you, you can phrase a detection or a non-detection of halos before below a certain scale as a statement about the mass of the dark matter particle. 
So, okay, this, this sounds simple, right? Is now all we have to do is count halos, right? And then we immediately learn about dark matter. And the, the problem with this is that most halos don't have a galaxy in them. So they're invisible and we can't count them. And so this is a problem, right? If, if you want to go this route, if this is your strategy and you have no way of detecting small halos, you're dead in the water, okay? And so this is where strong gravitational lensing is gonna come to the rescue because it's a direct, purely gravitational probe substructure, and we don't care if there's any galaxy in the subhalos. And I like to do intro to strong lensing with this, this movie. So this is a fish tank with a fish in it. And as I play the movie, you'll see that as the fish approaches the corner of the fish tank, you'll see the fish twice. So you'll see two images of the same fish as it approaches the corner, right? There's only one fish, but we observe multiple images of it, okay? So you can think of this as like a strongly lensed fish, right? And in, if you take the same intuition and you apply it to cosmology, rather than having just kind of a weak distortion of the shape of an object or a slight displacement in its position, if you have a more precise alignment, right, you'll actually produce multiple images of a single background source. And so this is what characterizes strong lens from, from weak lensing, right? Strong lensing, we get multiple images of a single source and they will be highly distorted and highly magnified. And just to illustrate this, uh, this is a picture. I, I usually use it as my zoom background, but I'm not, I'm not using it right now. So this is a, a galaxy cluster that is uh, acting as a strong lens and you can see by eye the distortions here. Uh, so I, I've circled the distorted parts of this image in red, right? And you can see that there are these warped, highly elongated, extremely bright uh, images of galaxies that are probably too far away to see directly without the magnification from the cluster, from the cluster's lensing. So, you know, I think this is probably the most in-your-face example of general relativity that you'll find, right? I mean, if you had good enough vision, you could see this in principle with your naked eye. But like I said, we're interested in small scales. So what, what we actually care about is strong lensing by individual galaxies, not galaxy clusters. So this is a, on the right, this is a very famous uh, galaxy scale strong lens. And just to give you an idea of what's going on. So this thing in the middle that I circled in, in yellow is, is just a regular galaxy. So just nothing interesting there, just a regular galaxy. And these four bright, uh, things around it are actually four images of a single background source. So the, the background source in this case is a quasar, which is the extremely bright nucleus of a galaxy. And so what's going on is that there's a galaxy behind the galaxy that I circled in yellow, and it has a very bright center. And that bright center is quadruply imaged, so you see it four times. And then this other stuff, this ring that I scribbled over in blue, that is just the galaxy that's surrounding the quasar, which itself is being lensed around. And so it gives you this, uh, you know, th this circle of light is called an Einstein ring. And then the four images are, we just call them four images. They don't have an interesting name, but th that's what you're looking at. <clears throat> and we can use these galaxy scale strong lenses as laboratories to find completely dark subhalos around the galaxy that's doing the lensing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the two primary ways that we can do this. The first one is called gravitational imaging. And that is where you directly find a single halo in the extended image or in the Einstein ring. And the second method, uh, which I work more, more closely on, uh, is analyzing the, the quasar flux ratios, uh, which is basically a statistical analysis of how bright the images are using a sample of these lenses. <clears throat> so uh, let me start with gravitational imaging. So th this is a, an example uh, where you have several galaxies on the right, uh, G1, G2, and G3. And these three galaxies are strongly lensing a background galaxy. The background galaxy in this, this picture appears as this blue arc. And there's this fourth galaxy, G4, that just so happens to be where the arc appears. 
And you can see by eye where the galaxy is and then the distortion that it imprints on the arc, right? And so, so this, when people do gravitational imaging, they're basically using this effect that if you have a halo or a massive object that's on an arc or one of these lensed arcs, it will produce a distortion in the arc that wouldn't be there if there were no structure there, right? So if, that, if G4 didn't exist, the arc would just continue undisturbed around uh, that side of the, the lens. And so this isn't quite gravitational imaging because we can see G4, okay? We're, we're interested in the, in the halos that are so small that uh, they wouldn't have a luminous part to them, right? They, they don't hold on to stars and gas and they actually wouldn't split the arc. They would just make a small distortion in its brightness. And to, to show you how that works, I have an animation that my colleague Simon Beerer made. And I'm gonna go through each panel of the, this video before I play the video. So on the bottom left, this is a source. It's just a picture of a galaxy. And using uh, gravitational lensing software, he computes how this source would look if it's strongly lensed. So the lensed source is now on top. So the input source and the input image is like the truth, right? It's like what he created. And in the middle, this is a reconstruction of the source and a reconstruction of the image. And you can tell by eye that this is a bad model, right? The, the source and the image don't look anything like the thing in the, the things on the left. But what's gonna happen in the movie is that this n max parameter, which is set to zero in the first frame, is going to increase. As n max increases, the, sophi the sophistication of the source model increases and you'll get a, a better and better fit uh, simultaneously to the source and to the lensed image. Uh, and on the right, you'll see the, the residuals, which is basically the left panel minus the central panel for both the source and the, uh, the lensed image. All right, so I'm gonna play the movie. Uh, as Nmax gets higher, you see that the source starts to look a little more complicated. And as it does, it starts to look more and more like the true source. And the lensed image starts to look more and more like the actual or the reconstructed image looks more and more like the actual image. And you can see on the right that there's this blob that pops out in the residuals, right? And this blob uh, is a 10 to the nine or a 1 billion solar mass blob of dark matter that was thrown into the model. And you actually can't, uh, you can't model it just using this smoothly parameterized model for the, the source and the galaxy. And so these completely dark halos actually pop out in the lensed images when you try to fit them with a smooth model because these halos are very compact and they're not smooth. And so you can't, you can't model them with a smooth model. And so what I just showed you was, was a kind of demo video. This, is a, this next panel shows gravitational imaging in practice. And uh, <clears throat> what you can see here on the, the top left is the data. And then the central panel is the model. And then the bottom right where I've circled, uh, I've circled something is the, the inferred like mass distribution around the arc. And you see that there's this concentrated blob of mass and this was one of the first detections of a completely dark halo in a lens dark. And this was done in 2012. <clears throat> so that, that's all I'm gonna say about gravitational imaging. Uh, I'll switch to flux ratios. Flux ratios, as I'll say in a second, are currently a little more powerful because they can go to smaller mass scales. So the, the same object that might affect the flux ratios, as I'll show you soon, uh, won't be detectable through gravitational imaging. And <clears throat> so, so flux ratios, uh, instead of, we, we kind of just ignore the arc, to be honest, and, and we just look at how bright the four images are. Uh, so that's the four images. I highlighted them on the right in red. And it uh, getting slightly technical, uh, it turns out that the image magnifications are proportional to second derivatives of the gravitational potential in the lens. And if you remember the, the Poisson equation for, for any physicists in the audience, right? The second derivatives of the potential are proportional to the mass density. And so if we put a very concentrated halo near an image, it can dominate the mass density and it will therefore impart a very, very large 
perturbation to the image magnification, even if it's you know thousands of times less massive than a galaxy. And so the, the flux ratios give us a highly localized but very sensitive probe of, of substructure. Uh, and to demonstrate this, I have another movie. So in this, this video that I created, I'm gonna drag uh, a blob of dark matter across a lensed image. And so the lensed image is on the right. And as I drag this halo across, on the right, you'll see what happens to the image, just what, what happens to its surface brightness. And on the left, you'll see the magnification of the image. Uh, I recommend you watch the right panel because I think it's cooler than the left panel. So as the halo comes in, it's this blue box, right? It starts to split the image, right? And then as it goes through, something really crazy happens and then it leaves and then the image brightness goes back to normal. And now, if you look at the left, right, you see the magnification as a function of this halo's position relative to the image. And you see that it changes from about nine or 10 to something like 16 or 17, right? So this is, it basically becomes twice as bright and that's kind of remarkable because this halo that I, this imaginary object or halo that I dragged across the image is actually 10,000 times less massive than the galaxy that's producing the multiple images in the first place. And so you, you can kind of think of this as like if the galaxy is a magnifying glass, these small halos act like cracks in the magnifying glass. So if you see something behind the magnifying glass and it happens to line up with this crack, you'll see it you know, highly distorted or, or warped. Okay, so that's strong lensing, right? Uh, how do we actually use this to learn about cold and warm dark matter in this particular uh, science case? So to do this, you can imagine, okay, well, what if I had these two populations of halos? And I ask, how would this particular lens look if it had an underlying population of halos like the one on the left or like the one on the right? So intuitively, you might say, okay, well, cold dark matter has lots of these small halos. So this magnifying glass has a lot of small defects in it. And I might expect to see some pretty wonky flux ratios or the, the image magnifications are going to be kind of all over the place. And in warm dark matter, the situation is different, right? You, you have a much smoother mass distribution, you have fewer halos, and it's less likely that one of them is going to be impacting a, an image magnification. And this is basically the, the intuition that underpins the analysis method is uh, we can look at lenses like this one and we can ask, you know, what kinds of models are going to fit the image magnifications? And you can actually, okay, and, and then just to be clear, what we're looking at here, the, the four images and, and yellow is the main lensing galaxy. You can actually make reconstructed mass distributions of dark matter that are consistent with what we've measured, right? So this on the left is a two-dimensional representation of the, the dark matter that's around this lens. And this particular realization of, of halos or this map of dark matter can explain the uh, image magnifications that we observed. And <clears throat> just to show you, you know, when we do this, we actually do it in 3D. So we generate uh, all of the halos between us and the source and uh, so you can see here in red, this is like the path traversed by the light rays. They get lensed around uh, the main lens plane, which has lots of subhalos in it. You see them as kind of a pancake. And then they continue flying through the universe and getting deflected by halos until they reach the source. So this is what's happening in our analysis is, is we generate millions and millions and millions of these uh, realizations of halos. And then we compute how the lens would look if that underlying population of halos were there. And just to show you some more examples here in the middle, this is a, an image, you know, the best image I could find of each lens. And it's flanked on left and right by, you know, possible reconstructions of the underlying dark matter. And the reconstructions themselves can look very different, right? I mean, there's many different ways that you can explain the data just by throwing a bunch of dark matter halos around this lens. Uh, here's another couple of examples, right? But it, it, it is true that some models are more likely than others in the sense that more, they, they, they produce a lens that looks like what we've measured more often. 
And so we can't tell just by one lens, maybe one plausible map of dark matter, what, what is true or false about dark matter. But if we look at a sample of lenses, like eight or 10, and we look at millions of different possibilities, we can say something about how likely a certain model is. So in this case, cold versus warm dark matter, how likely a model is based on how frequently it fits the data. And that's exactly what we do. And we've done this analysis uh, about two years ago using eight lenses. And we showed that dark matter can't be as warm as it appears in the right panel. Uh, and so, uh, you know, another way to phrase that this thing about dark matter can't be warm is, you know, we say that it has to be more massive than 5.2 kilo electron volts for a certain production mechanism. Uh, and so we've gone from not knowing anything about what dark matter could be to saying that whatever it is, it has to be more massive than 5.2 keV. Right? And you can imagine that if, if we detected you know, some kind of population of, of or, or a, a turnover in the halo mass function or, or an absence of structure below a certain scale, we could have even said its mass is between two certain numbers, right? But we didn't detect any characteristic feature in the, the population of halos. We just said that there must be more than a certain amount. And so we were able to set a, a lower limit on the mass of the dark matter particle. <laughs> So I'm, I think I'm running out of time. And so I just wanna wrap up a little bit and kind of bring it home. So, you know, first of all, I just wanna say that uh, it's, I think it's kind of remarkable that we can use gravitational lensing, which is uh, general relativity to study the properties of some subatomic particles, right? In this case, the, the particle properties of dark matter. And, you know, lensing is, is just one piece of the puzzle, right? Like what we've learned from lensing uh, doesn't just exist in a vacuum, right? It, it adds to what we've learned from other, other experiments, you know, things like the large scale structure of the universe, the bullet cluster, things like that. And so lensing is just one piece of the puzzle. And uh, I think in the next couple of years, we're gonna find many more lenses and hopefully make <clears throat> more statements about what dark matter can be and about what it can't be. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening and I hope I hope that was entertaining. Um, so for the next and from 15 minutes, we'll have um, a question and answer session. So if anyone have any questions, then they can put in the chat. Uh, Dr. Gilman, we have a question. So Alexi asks, is there any research into how dark matter might behave around black holes? Um, Yes, probably. Uh, it's not. It's not exactly my my area of expertise. Um, I do know that some, some people think about you know if you somehow have a, a means to collect dark matter around black holes, it it might form you know kind of a very high density area of dark matter, and that this would a allow you to uh, detect it more easily if it had any kind of interaction. Right? If, if it had any even extremely weak interaction with light it would become amplified in very high density regions. And so I think there's some people that think about those kinds of questions, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not very familiar with that area of research. Um, we have another question. So Roger asks, we have no idea what dark matter is, but we assume its existence because of its gravitational effect. We can detect the propagation of gravitational waves through the vacuum of space. Is it too absurd to wonder if the apparent mass of dark matter might be caused by the effect of some property of vacuum itself? Could vacuum be actually be dark matter? Could vacuum, so by the empty space being dark matter? Uh, I would say no, because uh, you know, there's multiple lines of evidence that suggest that dark matter is actual stuff. 
right? So the, the, the bullet cluster, I think, is a pretty compelling illustration of, of actual, an actual dynamic system where stuff behaves differently depending on the laws of physics that, that might govern it. And <clears throat> so in short, I no, I, I don't think so. I, I think most lines of evidence point toward, towards it being actual material and, and not just some kind of strange manifestation of gravity or, or something like that. Uh, we have another question. Adya asks, uh, what is the chance that dark matter might be a lighter not interacting because you know, electron kind of like the muon and tau particles? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, <clears throat> I, I think uh, the, the, the chance that it is something like that depends on how these particles behave uh, in cosmology. So, you know, if if they have uh, an interaction that's that's very weak, and they behave like cold dark matter in the sense that they form lots of structure and allow galaxies to form and stuff, then uh, they would they would be a perfectly viable candidate. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to whether they can match uh, both simultaneously the small scale observations of structure in the universe and the large scale ones. Um, Gary Murphy saw a uh, news item uh, about Sagittarius A star possibly being a dark matter. I, uh, he thinks because of a cloud does pass through it. Um, he didn't really understand the paper. Uh, so he's wondering if you could uh, give an insight on that. And he thanks you for the presentation. Um, I'm not aware of that, that paper. So I don't know if I can comment on that, on that specific uh, case. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, another question from Adia. So what real life applications the discovery of dark matter have? <laughs> um, it's a good question, uh, right? So why should we care about what dark matter is? I think is, is, is one way to, to some people phrase that. So I think that at present, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, we know so little, um, it's difficult to know in what way it could be useful, if it has any use at all. And I think, you know, as the more we learn, you know, maybe we'll find some way that we, we can harness dark matter for energy or something like that. But I think it's still, you know, way too early. And we're at present in the kind of the just fundamental exploration phase, where we just, we don't know. And we're just kind of, fumbling around in the dark, trying to figure out what's going on. And <clears throat> I, I mean, I guess for me, it's, I, I don't really come at this from a, a practical uh, standpoint. I mean, for me, this is just a, a fundamental mystery that is uh, tied into questions like, why are we here? And, and, and why is the universe the way it is? And so you know, for me, at least, this is more a question of just, curiosity and, and exploration than uh, real life applications. But I think that that's kind of a personal uh, viewpoint that you might get a different answer from other people. Um, Caleb asks, is uh, the sample size of strong gravitational lenses the biggest limiting factor for placing constraints on dark matter in this way? How many data points would you need to potentially see um, tensions with lambda CDM? So I'd say that uh, for this particular cold versus warm dark matter scenario, well, actually, scratch that. Let me put it this way. So once you get to a sample of 10, right? If you go up to a sample of 100, you get much better, but uh, that you get diminishing returns as you just start adding more and more lenses, right? So from five to 10 is, is really good, from 10 to 20 is, is okay. But then as you start adding more and more lenses, then, then your improvements start slowing down. And so I think that the, you know, the best way to make improvements now is to, is to come up with more clever ways to analyze strong lenses. In particular, if, if you can find a way to unite the information that you get from gravitational imaging with flux ratios, which right now are two completely disjoint uh, means of studying dark matter. I mean, I think that would be okay to get more information out of a smaller sample. Um, but yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. And <clears throat> how many data points would you need to see tensions with CDM? Uh, depends on 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 the 
dark matter model you're, you're discussing. So some of them might manifest with fewer lenses than others. Uh, so that, that depends. Um, uh, could dark matter potential potentially be a way to link general relativity to quantum mechanics? Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. I have no idea. Um, we have one more question. Um, Isabel asks, uh, how do you think the results from the new muon to experiment could change the way we think of dark matter? Uh, is this a recent experiment? Wow, you, you guys have some really interesting questions. I mean, I wish that I knew more about these questions, but uh, I'm not familiar with the uh, exactly what implications the new muon experiment has for, for dark matter. Okay. Yeah, I think those are, were all the questions. Um, this is the last chance for anyone who have any lingering questions in their mind. We still have uh, one more question. So um, Rahman asks, is there uh, dark matter influencing the gravity on Earth? Yes, so dark matter is, is everywhere. It's probably flowing through you right now and every dark matter particle has some mass and so it has some gravity associated with it. But the, you know, gravity it's, itself is very weak, right? Every time you lift your arm, you win against gravity. So. Uh, on kind of you know our terrestrial length and and mass scales, having some kind of diffuse cloud of dark matter around won't produce any measurable consequences. But if you start looking, you know, at a galaxy that's really far away, right, and you you kind of take a very large scale view of it, then most of the mass there is dark matter, and so most of the gravitational influence will be through the dark matter, and, and that's why you know, we turn to cosmology when we want to understand dark matter because that's where gravity becomes uh, so dominant. Um, so follow-up question. So, um, so are our measurements on Earth's mass incorrect? Uh, are our measurements of Earth's mass incorrect? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. Let me put it this way. So I think that the, you know, the uncertainties on the Earth's mass from you know, whatever means people measured it are probably much larger than uh, any uncertainty that has to do with how much dark matter might be around. Um, okay, I mean, there's some other questions. I can go through them if you want. Oh, oh yeah, uh, sure. I imagine you have strong thoughts about MOND. So MOND is, uh, uh, alternative gravity, where people say dark matter doesn't exist, uh, you just change the laws of gravity. Um, I don't. I don't have strong. Thought. I'm not emotional about Mond. I mean, I think that the evidence for dark matter is much stronger than the evidence for modified gravity, and uh, dark matter has more explanatory power across many different length and mass scales. So, you know, but I'm happy to be proved wrong if people who develop theories of modified gravity can show that that's actually a better explanation for the universe. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Someone asked, uh, did the web-like structure of the dark matter affect the universe's density or the density of the universe affect dark matter? Um, so I think that, uh, I guess I don't totally understand the the, the question, I mean, so dark matter is most of the mass in the universe. And so it drives structure formation. And there's certainly some kind of feedback effect between the, the dark matter and the regular matter gravitationally as the regular matter starts, starts collapsing. But since there's so much more dark matter, it's basically doing whatever it wants. And then, you know, normal matter just kind of goes along for the ride. So I think it's mostly the dark matter. Uh, that affects the universe's density. 